What does it take for us to build workplaces and a world that is fit for the future? A question that plagues many a leader and many an organization. How do we learn from our experiences? Are we shaping ourselves and our workplaces to be fit for the future? What does it take to invest in people and nurture success? How do we ensure that our investments in diversity, equity and inclusion are delivering to the intended goals? Are we seeing the very invisible responsibility that most employees carry, that of being caregivers? What does it take to build a caregiver-friendly workplace? Are leaders caregivers? What can leaders and organizations learn from caregivers and their experiences? How do we create safe spaces that enable inclusion? Is this something that is holding especially women back from the C-suite? We are delighted to bring to you a series of conversations around the idea of building future fit corporates. Vikrant Goel, who has experience across functions of human resources through a variety of companies and industries. He has specialized as a leader for organization transformation through his skills in facilitation, coaching, uh, interventions and training. He's been an entrepreneur himself and a consultant for a startup business to uh, organize the unorganized sector. Vikrant has been coaching startups in their growth journey on business and talent strategy. Vikrant is a dear friend and uh, I am delighted to have uh, Vikrant here today. Welcome Vikrant. Thank you, Varna. I'm as delighted if not more. It's a pleasure talking with you on this subject, which is in fact very close to my heart. Thank you, Vikrant. Um, the best place to start would be uh, for you to tell us a little more about yourself beyond what that cursory introduction did. <laughs> How do you relate uh, with the idea of caregivers, caregiving and caregiver sati? Sure. So, you know, let me straight off jump into the topic of caregiving as a bit of a background to me uh, and which has been something very um, close to me, a personal experience of mine. Um, you know, so I, I, I have been or had been extremely attached to my niece who was born a special child and survived 21 years and remained a special child um, with special needs. So uh, pretty much it, uh, you know, as one of my team members says, it takes a village to raise a kid. I think mm -hmm. when it came to my knees, it take a lot. It took a lot from the village as well as from many other people and um, you know specialists to raise her. But one of the most affectionate kids um, that I've had in my life, somebody who was very close to me. So caregiving, and she was you know um, she didn't have any motor activity. So throughout her life until the age of 21, and um, unfortunately she's not with us as of uh, last year. Um, there was. You know, there was a very intense experience, a very growing experience, but as well as a very occupying experience that not only her immediate parents and her immediate family, but the larger ecosystem, including us, had in the caregiving aspect, right? So this is, this, you know, has remained with me and shaped my way of looking at the world in a certain way. So it, it shaped me as a person, certain choices that I've made in life, very important choices. And what has it impacted? It, it certainly has impacted my philosophy towards my profession and why do I do it, for how, how long do I need to do it at different points of time, the importance of engaging in a profession which can provide money, but at the same time, the challenges of being available for caregiving. So mm. all of that has been influenced and shaped by that experience of 21 years. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and, uh, you know, I can I can sense uh, 
the significance of that relationship. I have interacted with you in the past. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like for you to also uh, probably give us an insight into is, um, you know, your relationship with caregiver Sathi. Well, uh, caregiver Sathi, thanks to you, ever since the conception of caregiver Sathi and uh, those philosophical conversation around the subject of caregiver and shaping caregiver Sathi, um, I had a few opportunities to contribute to caregiver Sathi actively, passively, uh, engage with caregiver Sathi in forums. Uh, one of the forums such I remember is with Lakshmi hosting it in Accenture for a yeah. bunch of our folks and I think that was an extremely enriching forum that we had and especially the way uh, you and your team conducted with certain examples and case studies really did open up to you know what employees and people experience inside the organization and some who do not actually experience it or even know about what's going on in the others lives you know so as they say in the corporate world that people live two lives there is one life that you bring to workplace and there is another life that you're actually living right and that has its own bearing so caregiver sathi i think i've not seen a parallel of caregiver sathi in the country at least i've not ventured too much outside of the country it's an extremely noble cause yet a cause which may have its own challenges in terms of grabbing the attention of the people in the corporates with all the various demands around you know the time of people but uh, I, I, I feel very proud for the fact that in whatever little form or format that I've kept myself connected with because of caregiver Sati. Thank you for saying that, uh, Vikrant. Uh, I think it would be worth uh, while to explore in our conversation today that as um, you know, head of HR, we were uh, a little while ago discussing about the BCG report and the caregiving challenge in Southeast Asia. It is um, indeed quite a surprise uh, in this publicly available report that um, there's a very significant population uh, across Southeast Asia, universally actually, but definitely across Southeast Asia where uh, employees identify as caregivers. Not too many people in India would know that um, as many as 88% employees relate with being a caregiver for most of their working life. Mm -hmm. That's a large number. What do you think? No, I, I am not surprised that that number is there. It's possibly a little more because of the diaspora and the culture in Southeast Asia, or I would say more in mainland Asia, in a larger part of Asia, because it's still a highly family centric culture and mm -hmm. less individual centric or individual career centric culture so there are a lot of you know family connections and the expectation of caregiving whether it is to uh, aging parents or it is to you know children the facility around uh, caretaking of children in the country or in the region is lesser so every individual plays multiple roles at the same time and has to make multiple choices so not surprising but yes of course very validating that the number is as high as you know such percentages which are you know leaves a little who are not the people who are in the caregiving roles so my question to you as the head of hr and somebody who works with startups and has worked in large organizations in the hr function would be to look at the mandate for the hr function or look at the mandate for a leadership team and say that how can we bring it to the attention of a leadership team that this is an investment worth making yeah you know now that we talk about it and it's not a strange phenomena see i would bucket caregiving into two buckets mm -hmm. what which is seen as a normal caregiving but is an important part of people's lives mm -hmm. which is you know children maybe children um, who are uh, possibly not at the age of being self-sufficient or are not in school, but still that duration of three to four or five years, both the parents and in today's urban world, it typically is not one parent who is a caregiver to such children. Um, and then even in this bucket, you would have a set of other people in the family and the surrounds for who one is a normal caregiver, which is 
you know, possibly retired parents, but self-sufficient enough to require a certain amount of care. So that is one bucket. There is another bucket of many, many of us, and I would not know the percentage, but I would suspect if 80% plus is caregiver roles, if you leave aside the first bucket and the second bucket also, there would possibly be close to about 40 to 50 percent who have an extraordinary responsibility or a special responsibility of caregiving of the kinds of what I narrated about my personal experience. And the reason I say that that percentage is also huge and does impact the individuals and the corporates and the professionals. Let me start by, you know, talking a little closer home. If I were to even look at just the leadership team of Games 24-7 itself, Mm. Um, I wouldn't go into the specifics, but I can almost tell you that about 40% of us have special situations of caregiving. We have some roles of caregiving that we manage along with our work. Right? I know that it draws on um, the time that we are able to uh, dedicate to our caregiving role. It draws on our professional lives also, you know, split us into you know, uh, our own personal mental makeup as to how we switching between roles, it has been challenging. Now, quite a few of us have been have been seasoned individuals, I would not say professionals, but surely out of, you know, the years that we walked on earth, we've learned how to manage these priorities, but it does call for a lot of understanding. If there is between, you know, the colleagues by themselves, when there are situations such that arise. Beyond that also, if I were to look at it, ever since COVID has happened and we've gotten back to workplace, one of the most frequently cited reason as to why a person would not want to look at coming back to office every day, uh, or sometimes even be possible for people to be in the city of work, is caregiving. Most of the time, yes, it is. Most of the times, it is not. In fact, I've rarely heard for a person to not be in the same city or not be able to come to work is a reason uh, of, you know, not liking the city or being more accustomed to another city or, you know, uh, the discomfort of coming to office. It is more often about either I have a little kid to nurse to or I have aging parents or I have parents or family members with certain, you know, abilities or certain conditions that I need to take care of. Mm. Uh, that is the biggest reason that we struggle with. Now, mm. as 24 7, we are a highly compassionate organization, highly flexible in many of these counts, but we do have our priorities which need to be balanced in, you know, in, um, in the scheme of things where, you know, there is an experience that one has had during the COVID times where not being present in person. Um, in some office or the other does take a hit on the collaboration, does take a hit on the productivity. Um, unfortunately, the world is also moving towards highly competitive business arena. And, you know, especially in the new age organizations where there is a fair amount of drain on expanding the organization, profitability becomes an important aspect. So it's a big dilemma that we face on situation by situation, as well as on the overall strategy of the organization that when it comes to reasons such cited why we've not very actively acknowledged the whole you know segment of caregiving or the you know persona of caregiving of an individual which becomes a need and it's not come up in strategic conversations but it is dealt with on case by case basis and it remains an ethical dilemma it remains a you know moral dilemma it remains a human dilemma as to what allowances one can give and what cannot right and it is increasingly becoming a problem, you know, while the longevity of people's, uh, you know, lives is increasing at the same time, it is also coming with its own package of, you know, inability to be self-sufficient. And not to say that, you know, many of the cities in India don't provide very conducive conditions for either aging or special people to manage by themselves. You know? That is true. So it's an important topic to contemplate on and it's really not entered the boardroom yet you know yes so yes absolutely no i understand that it hasn't uh, somehow entered the boardroom i like that phrase i'm going to use that uh, and uh, i'm going to you know in our conversation explore 
what might be the preoccupations of a leadership team and how can we bring this how can we make this figural enough or bring it into the boardroom what are the compulsions of a ceo a cfo and a chro when you know you are looking at the organization culture or investing for the future see if i were to look at it from the two fundamental things that you stated which is organizations care about uh, uh, and you know looking at from a perspective of culture both hmm. right? i think from a care about perspective very clearly and it's the media is pretty active the social media is pretty active as to what organizations are looking at and if hmm. i were to keep it to the um, to the segment of hmm. uh, population professional urban population a little more with a flavor of new age organizations that can always relate that to even the earlier companies that i worked in i think um, there's very fierce competition there are many and many and much more rapid frequent geopolitical economic dynamic situations that are happening in the world so the health the financial health and the performance of the organization and the growth is the most significant care about so mm. a lion's share of the conversation and of course it is no more a topic to you know debate that the biggest asset an organization has is its people because that's that's really the asset which leads to any kind of a success for the organization but at the same time the conversations are more about you know the financial health the profitability the growth of the organization with compassion towards what are the best what is the best that an organization can do for its people to remain highly engaged and to be inspired to achieve more from the organization context so it is a conversation about the people and it is a conversation about what can we do for the people often times then it does center around how how do we tweak our policies and what are the benefits that we can provide to people and that is where mostly the visible aspects or the most oft talked aspects of people's lives are addressed right mm -hmm. one would address you know parenting one would through pat leave mat leave you know through the facilities that one can provide inside the office one would address the issues around time spent on the road through transportation one would address things around insurance and health of the individual one would address things around the benefits that one can provide over and above in terms of ergonomics and best health practices and well-being practices going even further across to uh, you know eap employee assistance program for counseling mental well-being yeah it's rare that one is able to go beyond all of this also yeah. into looking at lives of people and mm. what roles are they playing one of which can be a very significant influence on their well-being is a caregiver role right so that sure. doesn't creep in as such now when it comes to culture right from a culture perspective again when it comes to culture there are two things if i were to largely look at it creating a conducive culture of ethics integrity engagement inspiration mo motivation and positivity um uh, and an authentic culture with um you know lesser or no flavor of things which can become um sort of daunting for a person to fathom and to work mm. with organization politics those aspects as well as a culture which is focused on the well-being of the individual right many mm. of the things that i mentioned as more hardcore in the first aspect come into the play in this but beyond that looking at what are the other needs of an individual or what is the context of an individual is rare to creep in now why does that happen is it not that we are not aware that we are playing certain roles which demand our you know mental physical emotional space and that needs to be addressed even when it comes to our productivity and our engagement at the organization we are aware and many of us who are making these you know who are leading the organization culture and policies and the agenda of the organization are going through some of this but i think it's just that 
it's not just it is that that there are just too many things on the plate so mm. the ones that are more visible take precedence mm. going deeper into reflecting that what is beneath the surface yeah. is not something which comes out very often yeah you know yeah um and it needs to it needs to i think i would i would uh, you know take a shot at saying and reminiscing on the conversation that we had at accenture with lakshmi and team and the other colleagues of ours that were there mm. that just instigating a conversation and i'm literally calling it the word instigating and not initiating instigating a conversation for us to reflect yeah through a story of somebody right mm. if i can tell you if 11 or we are about eight of us in the senior leadership team of this organization we were to you know sort of instigate mm. or touch upon this topic through a story mm. most of us will be able to relate to it and would yeah. get motivated to want to bring this up into the boardroom like i said but how do we pick this up how do we you know have a broader view towards what our population our you know teams have been experiencing and which by the day is changing do you next- think that it is harder to bring the conversation in because a majority of the board members are men and men don't easily talk about caregiving it's a, now that you mention it it certainly would be an important piece of it now in senior leadership teams diversity could be one aspect um in formal setups hmm or in called out agenda meetings or meetings which are have a professional tonality and conversation to it there is a certain inhibition in peeping into the roles that we play outside of our professional role right right and um while that does come out a little mm. more in happy hour conversations or one on one conversation in fact i would say when it comes to men it comes out more at least my experience has been in the professional world that a peek into the roles that we play outside of work comes out more in mo- slightly more intimate one to one conversations than even in casual non agenda based group conversations so there is a inhibition but i'm not 100% sure whether this inhibition is because of the gender alone or is it because of the uh, assumption we hold around the stoicism associated with the role of a leader whether a female or a male mm interesting right okay. interesting so i have a question for you yeah when we are building managerial capability yeah we have built managerial capability as hr professionals across organizations in many ways yeah we teach managers how to manage performance and we say manager is the first unit of employee engagement right yeah um how can caregiver role sensitization be significant for first time managers first level managers in your opinion irrespective of gender yeah one of the lines that i've been towing because i deeply believe in that in games 247 when it comes to any sort of you know managerial slash leadership grooming is deepening the self awareness and when it comes to deepening self awareness it is recognition of the um integration of multiple roles that we play and what locus do we play those roles from and through what beliefs nice so we we do bring in that aspect in interventions in reflection and coaching as well as an active grooming of individuals mm. i think that is a segue into bringing this aspect into people management that mm. a manager is talking with an individual team member of theirs they are not talking with one person but they are talking with a person who mm. is 
bundle of roles that they are playing mm. so it is important while people do want to keep a certain amount of guard up on how much of their personal aspects and roles that they play are known to others but i think encouraging the possibility that a role that an individual plays there's a role individual plays there are in fact multiple roles individual plays in the profession itself a role of a boss of a team member of an employee of a you know so on so forth similarly in personal life we are playing multiple roles that's Now, right being sensitive considerate and not too intrusive yet wanting and creating that space for the person to for individuals to feel the comfort of referring to the other roles that they play and what impact those roles are having on their occupation as well as what needs are those roles creating for them for the organization to be sensitive about you know so that can be a segue into it it needs to start from looking at a manager's role to not be a mechanical process with certain skills of delegation and performance management to be learned but more of an art and a deeper science of understanding one's own individual self and through that the others that they are a bundle of roles that they play so there is something beyond the surface that you can see which needs to be recognized if the person's best performance needs to be brought on to the table that's right and um i have another lead question for you so if you are talking to first level managers or first time managers you would probably highlight the fact that you need to be aware and you need to be sensitive to the fact that your team members have a multitude of roles that people are playing in addition to of course a multitude of identities and that interplay uh, can be very valuable um, now having said that um uh, what do you think can be the role of sensitizing the organization to say it is okay to bring the personal part of yourself and your life to the workplace although no one else has thus far brought it it is not yet a policy let me give you an example mm -hmm. and you know this well enough you and i were colleagues in texas instruments yeah. when i was the first ever adoptive parent yes right let's reflect on that experience and say what it meant for uh, the hr leader and the organization to make a special accommodation and what it may have meant for an individual to seek that as a caregiver hmm. yeah that's what i was reflecting on that what makes a person bring their self and their context at work and feel safe to talk about it yeah is really the response that they get from the organization in sure. two formats a formal response through a request or through even bringing up the context second is an informal response which is sometimes unconscious with bringing that context into the conversation as a reference point on any positive or negative outcomes mm -hmm. third is what what do the people around not necessarily any organization representative in form of a manager or a leader but the colleagues normal yeah. colleagues around how are they responding to this information what That's expectations true. or acceptance are they having of this information whether it is a context of that you talked about many years ago about being a adoptive parent or it is a context of somebody having a special needs person at home right like, i i think either of these journeys you know we are looking at to sensitize the organization i don't think it should be looked at for sensitizing roles in the organization like let's sensitize the managers or the leaders etc 
Okay. I think sensitizing needs to be to sensitize individuals. Okay. And how does the individual get sensitized around this? If we are anyway saying, and let's just even hold the BCG study to its uh, you know data that if eighty percent of plus of the people are experiencing that role in some capacity or the other. Right. When talking about individuals themselves, yeah. that yeah. you, I, as an individual, have certain you know contexts, personas, and roles that we play. Right. right. And how can what would make us feel more comfortable in an organization to bring right. that in? And make our colleagues who are also possibly going through the same thing feel comfortable with how we respond, right? Yeah. So I would not take it as a segmented approach that it needs to be sensitized leadership and down and then to a manager role and so on and so forth because nobody's playing a role over here. I think it's every individual who's going through this and has a need. So the individual needs to be talked about that you are playing multiple personas. Mm. What do you want to do and bring these personas to you know, the workplace and how would that help? So, yeah. you know, what I uh, can, allow me to paraphrase what we just explored, which is that it is hard for organizations and leaders to imagine all the potential circumstances yeah. that a variety of team members may be going through because they are so individual, so unique, and they could be so dynamic. It is not possible as a leader to yes. imagine, sensitize everybody and the whole organization. However, an organization can do best is create the conditions for safety, yeah. for speaking up, and for the confidence that you could seek an accommodation should you share your special circumstance. Then it is contingent upon the individual to say that here is my circumstance. I don't know how to navigate this or I need a special consideration. Can I bring this up to my HRBP or can I bring this up to my manager or to my leadership? It is a partnership between the organization and the uh, individual where the individual has a big role to play. Yes, you are bang on in summarizing what I meant. And I would even further qualify that by saying that, you know, it is a little unreal to expect a manager to be a superhuman, to be able to display all the traits of a compassionate human being, yet wanting to have a productive team member. Right. And because of which it's important to create that comfort and ability in people in general in the organization as That's against right. putting another role onto a manager, which That's they find right. daunting. And even the managers come with different personalities. Right. Yeah. So and well, human resources is expected to have that, you know, kind of depth or, yeah. uh, you know, even the air of compassion to for somebody to bring it. And with what you said is what I really meant that create the environment where everybody is growing individually, yeah. right? To be able to absorb, accept, invite, and support these yeah. conversations around the roles that we play. So let's take a look at uh, the view of uh, a progressive HR leader who recognizes this and also is sensitive to the fact that managers cannot uh, be superhuman beings. And therefore, what would you do from the standpoint of policies to recognize employee caregivers? Well, <clears throat> I think at the bare minimum, it is going to be important to start looking for opportunities where in a non-intrusive or a jarring fashion, the topic about, you know, sensitivity towards the caregiving role that many of us play needs to be mm -hmm. weaved in into the fabric of various forums and capability building forums that we create in the organization. That's the bare minimum. And I 
I would not, you know, take this in a programmatic approach like DEI has been taken in many places. Okay. Uh, because I, that's my personal, you know, outlook towards it. That once we take it in a programmatic approach, it does render its own mechanical, um, you know, flavor to it, as against in spirit working towards creating that culture, right? Mm -hmm. But initiate it through bringing this into the fabric of conversations, and that would require some deliberation. Along with that, I think some uh, more tangible things that can be looked at and done is introducing um, not, I, I wouldn't, I, I hate the word policies, but I'm left with no other word is to look at certain guidelines, policies, you know, uh, things that we've stated similar to the mat leave and so on and so forth. Thinking deeply as to how, without it becoming a very debatable policy, can there be some facilities that are provided, facilities, provisions, accommodations through what is written in the books for people who may have needs around caring, caregiving yet do not tilt the balance of the organization having to compromise too much, right? So tightrope to walk. <laughs> yeah, it is a tightrope to walk because, you know, uh, it, it does become difficult. And surely now looking at it from the other light, that if we are talking about, let's say, 88% of the people having that role to play, right, uh, you know, defining a policy such that will, you know, kind of impact all of those 88% of the people, but in turn may reduce the output outcome a team member can give to the organization will also be detrimental, right? So one has to make it as to how do you, I'll give you a simple example, right? Now, this example, which kind of has a overlap with caregiving in a certain way that one looks at you know, providing crash facility. Yeah. Now, by the statute, organizations are supposed to provide crash facility. Now, it's not intrusive into the organization's ability to gain its, you know, reach its targets. In fact, it's facilitative because people find a safe place for mm -hmm. their kids to go to while they can, you know, work a little more free of mind. Now, things like that, that how can it be facilitated? right, in the caregiving role. Now, caregiving role has multiple aspects of it and how, you know, some of these policies can be looked at. Caregiving role, at least the two aspects of it is, there is a time and a physical need that needs to be provided to, to a care uh, person who needs care. And the other aspect is what is happening to the caregiver in the process. That's right. So how can, you know, slowly, gradually, maybe still with baby steps and doesn't become too large a thing to digest, certain provisions, accommodations, policies, facilities be provided for in, in such a manner that the caregiver is able to better and in a lighter manner take care of the caregiving role and thus become more productive and engaged at workplace. So I'm going to take you to a blue skying space and say that it might be difficult for one organization to provide that because it's a tightrope walk. Yes. How can a group of organizations come together yes. and collaborate in designing policies that can work for everyone I think this and is infrastructure that can work yeah. for everyone? Yeah, I think a very important word that you used over here is infrastructure and to provide and work towards the infrastructure because and very logically, it is a great thing if group of organizations or a forum of organizations can come together. Because at the end of the day, if you look at it, you know, let's even assume 50 percent of a workforce or people in the organization are married. Then even their spouses who are in the other companies are going through the same kind of things. Right. That's right. And whether they are married or not, we would have siblings who are going through the same kind of thing in different That's organizations. Right. Right. So if there is, you know, certain infrastructure, infrastructure always can be much broader 
if organizations come together like if you remember now since you refer to rti days in ti you know one of the biggest problem that organizations were trying to solve at that point of time is how to maneuver the bangalore traffic so a group of organization in bagmani tech park came together to provide buses to all the you know occupants of that's bagmani right. tech park that's right, right. against individual organizations putting more buses onto the roads and increasing the traffic problem yeah right? It's a similar kind of a thing, and yeah, I think that's a fabulous idea. That's a fabulous thought. Yeah, I would think that you know probably let's say ten organizations came together and set up a daycare facility for older adults. Yes. Right, or yeah. uh, people with special needs, so yeah. that they can have access. to physiotherapy um you know skill building and what have you uh at the time that the uh so called employed uh regular employees can go uh without worrying about the physical care or the social needs you see home based care can also render people isolated and in need for social interaction yes um many many things can be done bhavna in fact i think even if one starts with organizations coming together on a very small little thing of you know creating a you know online forum a place mm. where people can get options and get to know of ways to handle their own situations Mm. I mean, I'll give you a simple example that if somebody has got a special needs person at home, most of us very individually in our own ecosystem struggle to see how can we find help to be with that person when we are away. Right? Even if there is a suggestion forum, as simple as that, all the way to can there be physical setups that can be created? Something even like. you know spaces where seniors can come and play games like whether it's card games or various other things right and have some social interaction and can be you know out there in you know a community where they are also taken care of but yet spend good time you know yeah so yes when organizations come together the power the force multiplies you know yeah no absolutely uh, so uh, taking the idea further by the way let me do a plug here which is that uh, you can log into the caregiver sathi website mm -hmm. and uh, raise questions and ask and seek support and we have infinite resources that you can use okay infinite might be an exaggeration <laughs> but we do have a large number of resources and we commit to uh, bring to you solutions that uh, you know you may pose uh, having said that uh, vikrant what i'd like to move to next beyond policies is uh, building a culture of caregiving and caregivers what i'd like to do right now is not just look at employees who are caregivers and therefore them as liabilities but flip it on its head and say what do you think are competencies that caregivers have that could be valuable to organizations yeah yeah i think one didn't think in those lines you know caregiving has multiple such things that a person grows into and with while performing that right being responsible you know various various things i think being responsible towards another and you know compassion empathy um to an extent resilience and tolerance right so i think that's that's fabulous that how some of the roles that we play not only come into the organization with the needs of the individual for the role that they play but also what does it bring to the table in terms yeah. of you know competencies that they bring i i don't know how this can be brought into the organization good to deliberate on but i think it's a fabulous one that you know it brings us a one of the things it brings very significantly is resourcefulness that's right I mean, for project management multitasking yes, multitasking project management and that's that's great that nurturing that is, yeah nurturing you know uh, mm -hmm. that's great and that that is a part of when one is sensitizing individuals in the organization of what the multitude of roles 
shape you as this can also be a part that it strengthens many of your you know traits and characteristics with time the, management i have time. a very special memory of a colleague of ours from ti days yeah when i was a young mother and i asked her how did you manage your career she was seen a woman colleague yeah she gave me a schedule that she followed which was to <laughs> the minute yes right? she would like do this from 10 to 10:15 or 7 to 7:15 then 7:15 to 7:30 my god uh, it was a master class in time management uh indeed and I, i i can appreciate that because increasingly while i'm not a caregiver necessarily in the full sense of the word to my mother but having said that with an aging mother there are some of the things in my routine or in my day that i have made it absolutely chock a block routine that exactly at 6:45 am i'll you know set up the kitchen for her for her to do her breakfast and things so my you know morning cycling and exercise needs to finish by 6:30 in the morning so i have to wake up at 4:30 and it's a i think it's a very functional routine right and it makes me more productive so so you right you know time management is a big thing and um you know it's it's a it's a skill that all of us can always improve yeah. um i'd also like to bring in the point around resilience and you know one of the big considerations of organizations is innovation and anticipating for example the changing uh, tax structures uh, geopolitical concerns everything else that you mentioned it requires a certain agility of the mind and being innovative which means uh, anticipating issues but being considerate of people who will be impacted that's right guess who can do that best caregivers <laughs> i would think so not just because i have that lens but yeah you know now that you're saying it it's you're right and maybe not all caregivers but many of the caregivers so um when i think about it i think most of the financial decisions taxation decisions etc in my life are governed by the role that i have to play towards my mother and so what safety net do i need to create how do i need to invest i think those considerations come in pretty deep so so it is you're right and you really touched upon a very important aspect of what can be brought in from a you know sort of a positive spin around you know caregiving that how can the caregivers be brought into light to share their journeys in a format of the skills that they've built that others can for being used for being more that's effective right. that's right i think that's fantastic. another plug another plug <laughs> yeah. which is that uh, at caregiver sathi we invite caregivers to tell their stories and they are called conversations with gentle warriors wow. because uh, you know they are warriors they're fighting a battle that is unseen but in a gentle fashion and we encourage organizations to create safe spaces where employees who are caregivers can leverage storytelling wow. as a way to shine the light on that aspect of their lives that is not often spoken about in public forums excellent and that's excellent i think that's a great thing yeah very good okay. so organizations that wish to create such spaces yeah. no way to go yes storytelling and you know that's a great art and it it is a it may it makes the whole effort or you know the uh, the enormity of it come down yeah you know through the storytelling aspect of it and yeah like this really, in avatar right i yeah. see yeah i it, see correct it was very visible in you know that the way you folks had brought in that story in the forum that we did in accenture i think it just it removed the hesitation inhibition around talking some of these through the narration the narrative it was fantastic thank you yeah. 
Uh, one of the other things, Vikrant, that you spoke about is that a lot of consideration for people to want to work from home seem to be driven by caregiving. And uh, if we look back at our career and we would say that, you know, we did invest a lot of time and energy in understanding why people leave organizations and conduct exit interviews. Uh, until a few years ago, uh, people would mostly women, would refer to leaving the organization for quote-unquote personal reasons. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. What do you think we can do to mine that information and flip it on its head to say, do we have a talent workforce that we haven't tapped into? I'm, you know, I don't really have a clear answer on this one because it's a, I would say a little more cultural thing and I wouldn't call it out as a cultural thing to the Indian culture thing, but it's surely what is the corporate culture that has got created and the care abouts of the corporates that authentically getting this data. Mm. Like you said, that most, whether now, earlier it may be women employees saying for personal reasons, and now it is men and women both saying personal reasons, while you know some piece of that may be for the caregiving reason or for other such reasons. But I, I would say unconsciously over the years, the culture has got created such that it's a safer route to not give a specific reason or you know to reveal all the specifics of the reason for needing to step out of an organization or the workforce mm. to avoid any kind of you know further conversation deliberation debates on it and have it an easier one so i'm not very sure because we've also been trying to solve for this as to how do we you know this data can be pretty potent in being able to make some moves and shifts and changes in the way an organization operates or does things. But that's not available. As much as you encourage people, people so, do not want to state. I am so glad that you said this because, um, you know, exit interview data is not available and mm -hmm. it is not uh, authentic enough yeah. to be leveraged in order to understand why people leave organizations. Correct. I don't think solving for attrition can be done at the point of exit. Correct. Because that data is not reliable. Absolutely. And we know that exit interviews can be a function of so many things. Correct. You and I have left organizations and you don't want to burn bridges, quote unquote. Exactly. Right. And uh, you also may not find it valuable enough, despite mm -hmm. whatever somebody says, to say, let me tell you what I really felt or went through. Is it really worth it now that I'm leaving? Yeah. So as leaders, as CXOs, as CHROs, the place to look for data of potential attrition might be elsewhere. That is true. Right? Yeah. And that is where, again, it comes back to that chicken and egg, right? That if there is more understanding and knowledge of, you know, the context and the roles a person is playing, you know, it will definitely increase the predictability of po and possibilities of attrition. I think attrition is not only a outcome of, look, this organization is not providing me all that I need for the various other roles that I play, but also because of the changing priorities based on the context and the situation, right? So if there is an understanding, there'll be a more authentic and, you know, authentic and uh, uniform ability to predict and understand why a person would leave an organization, you know? So, and in most places, Honestly, in most places, even something as simple as, look, I, you know, if I'm in Bangalore and, uh, you know, we're we are two working parents and we've got a little kid, we don't have any support system. And in Bangalore, you don't find help so easily. And so because of which, 
in spite of the fact that it might take a career hit on both the family members, but we'll need to shift back to, let's say, Delhi, where we have more support system. Right? So that's that's an information which doesn't come so easy. It comes only at the time of exit. But if it were to come through the route that we are going through a caregiving experience at this point of time, one would, you know, if one can make certain allowances and have certain ways in which one can, you know, help, that's okay. But more than that, one would understand that, you know, there can be a possible attrition risk out here. Right. Uh, you know, I was talking to an ex-colleague of mine and, uh, I don't know, 20 years hence, he told me that uh, what he mentioned at the time of leaving the organization, and I was the HRBP, he mentioned that he's going to this other bank because they are going to pay him so much more. Only 20 years later, he said actually he wanted to move to Delhi because he had recently lost his dad. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It is so, very significant enough. It is very significant. It changes life circumstances, so the priorities of life. Right? Yeah, yeah. And sometimes employees believe that you do not have the power to influence the systems, the policies of an organization, and the only way out for you is to seek another employment rather than renegotiate in a yeah. certain way with your organization. Um, I mean, these are many considerations, some of which are easy and some of which are difficult for organizations to think about or worry about. But uh, we do believe that organizations that are fit for the future will have the resilience or the flexibility to account for the changing employee needs. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And, you know, I think the organizations will have to start thinking like the way we think about our business, um, even for the people, because we think about one of the big underlying themes of our business is hyper personalization. Right? Right. For the when it, but when it comes to, you know, managing an organization, we always look for standardization of policies. Well said. Say more. You know, so hyper-personalization is going to be important. People, each individual has their uniqueness, unique stories, unique needs, unique things. And the organization shy away from it only because there could be a set of people who may want to use the system, right? But I think that is not enough of a reason for us to not start looking at hyper-personalization in the way we approach the needs of our employees too, right? Um, it can be a beginning. I think there needs to be a sunset of an era of complete standardized approach towards, you know, catering to the needs of our team members. Um, much of that is changing in a way. Some of that, in fact, not much. There are many other things that one can look at if one just thinks about hyper personalization when it comes to responding to team members' needs. So it's time for another shameless plug and say that uh, we have developed some very interesting corporate offerings that help you hyper personalize wow. the needs of employees. And uh, I love the fact that you haven't been paid to say this, Vikrant. <laughs> yes, I haven't. <laughs> that no, that's great. That's great. I will certainly explore that. and. It's, it's left me with a thought also that, you know, as a theme for not only a theme just for the sake of the year, I think as we carve out the future of human resources agenda in the organization, and since it is a theme in the organization, which is so important for us, hyper-personalization is something that I'll, you know, contemplate. All right, then. Uh... I think it is a good point for us to take stock of the last one hour and for you to say how this has been for you and any closing remarks. It's like I, you know, started the conversation saying it's a, you know, personal narrative, a story that has been very close to my heart. It's been, you know, in it's it's been a part of my thought process for a long time. I, I do my bit in my own way in the organization. Uh, I think the conversation ignited many more thoughts. For example, you know, 
turning it around on the head and seeing what are what is that that the caregivers bring which is more unique than the others to all the way to things like hyper personalization towards our teens and people it's been really good i'm going to make uh, quick notes for myself as i step out of this conversation um i know i'm not going to make any you know lofty promises to myself that i'll change the world tomorrow because i know it's in recent times i've realized it's only baby steps and small habits that create larger things so okay. i do intend to take a resolve of creating small habits individually as well as an organization small habits and small changes that can contribute to a better world in making or uh, which is a world full of caregivers increasingly is going to be more you know in in the future so thank you for you know initiating this it's been highly meaningful for me and i'm sure it's a seed sown for something to germinate which is going to be a shadow for many many more people and we look forward to partner with you uh, on this so uh, i hope that uh, we can find ways of creating some really innovative pioneering work indeed indeed we shall like always we will thank you very much for thank your you time for vikrant thank um, you i love talking to you and uh, thank you for your openness i do too it was a pleasure